Well, I'm a fighting soldier and I'm on the understanding of brother keeble is um man greatly limited if we don't really try to tease out our understanding of uh, of the works of uh, those who preceded him and those who were also his contemporaries yeah you said that this story needed to be told because i i think about that uh for many of us we learn the story of keeble but that limits kind of our exposure uh, to what you're talking about, particularly if we think we understand something in any sort of deep way, when really we just know a, a biographical sketch of one man, though great. What do you think we're missing uh, when what has been missing for a history of Churches of Christ that just really learns Keeble, but kind of misses all the other significant figures that you list here? Yes, yes. That, thank you. For that question, that's very good. Um, I, I, I believe this, uh, that, you know, we're missing a whole lot if we see Marshall Keeble, if you will, as the beginning and end of African American Churches of Christ. Uh, I, I think, first of all, about his father-in-law, uh, S.W. Womack, uh, born in 1851, died in 1920, so he was a former slave. And he exerted tremendous amount of influence on uh, Brother Keeble. And so learning a little bit about his story, it's not a whole lot, but there's, there's enough there in the Gospel Advocate uh, that really uh, is quite revealing. And in fact, S.W. Womack came under the influence of David Lipscomb. And, and he helped to shape the theological mindset, if you will, of African American Churches of Christ through the pages of the Gospel Advocate. So, so S.W. Womack, and then there's a gentleman, Alexander Alec Campbell, who was a African American who wore the name of our uh, great um, hero, if you will. And so Womack and Alexander Campbell collaborated to establish what is now the Jackson Street Church of Christ in Nashville, Tennessee. And Keeble referred to that church at one time. In fact, in a 1939 article, Keeble referred to uh, the Jackson Street Church of Christ as the mother church of uh, African American Churches of Christ. And he didn't mean that chronologically, but in terms of its uh, religious, spiritual impact that it had. Uh, so he, he was, he may have been on to, on to something there. Uh, another reason why it's important that we not just zero in on Marshall Keeble is that we, we fail to understand others who blazed the trail for Brother Keeble, such as S.R. Cassius. And then not only that, there are those individuals who were beyond the circle, if you will, of Middle Tennessee, who also exerted tremendous amount of influence on by the key. I'm thinking, for example, of a gentleman by the name of F. F. Carson. Uh, his story surfaces in the prologue of my book there. Uh, F. F. Carson, a spiritual a warrior, uh, a native Texan. His parents were slaves. Uh, here's a guy who converts to the Stone Campbell movement and kind of makes his way to Dallas area, Oklahoma, then Kansas, and then eventually out west to uh, California, where he worked with congregations there and helped to develop them so that the North Richmond Church of Christ in Northern California actually began sending out white missionaries. What's significant about that is that at a time when mostly African American preachers depended on support from white Christians, you have a, a black congregation who's sending out a, a white missionary and his name was a Miles T. Toon. And I connected recently with his son who preaches in Virginia uh, uh, right now. And uh, he was, he, when he learned about my book and, and he called me up, he tracked me down and, and that was an amazing story. 
how this gentleman who is preaching the gospel uh, in um, Virginia, uh, his father was supported by this predominantly white black congregation in Northern California. And then we got to remember the women, the women. Um, you know, if we focus solely on Keeble, we ignore the contributions that women made to the growth and development of African-American Churches of Christ. Uh, uh, Annie C. Tuggle, sure, but, but Minnie Womack, who became Marshall Keeble's first wife, his second wife, Laura uh, Keeble, actually lived to be over 100, uh, I want to say 100, 500, 6, something like that. Uh, she uh, contributed substantially to his success as a minister. Uh, Maggie Hogan, as well as Fanny Bowser and, and many, many others. And so, um, and, and then I, you have to think about um, other uh, important people as well. Uh, there's a chapter on um, the, the participation of African Americans in, in the World Wars, World War I, World War II. You see, if we just focus on Keeble, you know, who was, you know, who never joined the military, we, we forget about these other people who, in their own unique way, were making contributions uh, for the cause of Christ. So, you, yeah, I mean, your dissertation on Cassius, mm -hmm. and then you go out and you do some, some biography. Now you've told the story of the entire movement, so the, the kind of... Um, the umbrella is getting larger. Why did you decide to write this book? Yes, a good question. Well, I, I want to make it clear uh, uh, to those who are, are listening and who might listen to this later. You know, my, the title of my book is Hard Fighting Soldiers, A History of the African American Churches of Christ. I, I don't, it's not the history, but it's a history. I think that's important simply because I want people to know, I don't believe I've written the last word on uh, this particular movement, but I hope it's a good start and I hope that others will build on it. But um, someone has said that history is largely biography. Uh, it's, it's when we study the lives of individuals that we are really opened up, we are exposed to a whole world that tells us not only that individual story, but, but our own American story. And for that reason, um, so I, you are correct that uh, Brother Cassius and Brother Keeble, and then I've tried to expand. Uh, but, but having said that, I think there are still some other stories that, that ought to be told. And hopefully uh, there'll be some students who will come along and, and give that serious consideration. What do, yeah, what are some of them? That's interesting. Kind of, uh, if you could make a quick little uh, bullet list of uh, research projects you'd like somebody else to do, what would they be? <laughs> yeah, good, good question. You know, um, actually, uh, Jamie Gorman edited a book recently, uh, Slavery Shadow. Yeah. And in that particular book, I contributed an article on the relationship between Ari and Hogan and Jimmy Lovell. Here we have a black preacher and a white Christian who collaborated in a time of racial separation to advance the cause of Christ. One of the things I would like to do, or maybe someone can consider doing it, is um, really expanding on that relationship because it was a unique relationship. And Arin Holman is one of those uh, noteworthy individuals who established a lot of congregations throughout the United States, uh, thinking of the Figueroa Church of Christ in Southern California. There are churches here in Texas that he planted, as well as Oklahoma City. I saw yesterday in the Christian Chronicle where there's a little uh, piece on uh, the preacher, uh, Brother Crenshaw, who passed away some years ago. Well, that congregation was established by Arnold Hogan. And so, but that was made possible largely because of the monetary support that Jimmy Lovell raised uh, for um, Arian Hogan. And so that just am amazing. And of course, uh, Jimmy Lovell will go on to launch the, the World Bible School, which is still with us today, as I understand. So that's an amazing 
a story there. I've been in contact with his daughter who lives uh, in uh, California. And so that, that's, uh, and then ACU has a very nice collection of the Lovell papers and letters and correspondence. And uh, I, I have some copies of those. And so uh, that, that's just one uh, of maybe, maybe some others that people uh, could uh, consider. Maybe some of the students at HTS could consider that. Yeah, I, I think that a lot of the alumni who are watching this here, who thankfully they've, they've written their term papers here and probably right. some of them are thankful <laughs> to be done with that. But yeah. they're watching this and a lot of uh, them are in ministry and it clearly we can't talk about the history of African-American Churches of Christ and not kind of talk about the present and the future. And if, if you don't mind, uh, just give us a little bit about what the present and future of uh, historically black churches of Christ would be. And then also it might just be helpful kind of in what ways do you see that intersecting what we might call historically white churches or predominantly white churches kind of uh, sitting there as Edward Robinson, as you've done all this history, if, if history helps us understand the future, what do you, what do you understand? Yeah. Yeah. Good, good, good question. Um, I'm thinking, you know, currently uh, African American churches of Christ in some ways it could be argued or, or at like a crossroads from the standpoint, what I mean by that is, as I see our fellowship, and again, I'm, I'm a flawed person, uh, but I, I see us kind of splintering into maybe three camps, if you will. You have those who might be considered to the left, if you will, and by, and, and again, I, I realize I have to be careful about those designations, but I'm just trying to help us understand to the left by left. I mean, those who might be more open to like using praise teams. Some may uh, have gravitated even toward incorporating instruments of music. The, it's not, they're not very numerous, but they are, they are there. Okay. And then you have those who are kind of to the extreme right. Okay. Um, and I kind of touch on this in uh, the, the book, uh, to the extreme right, those who say that you shouldn't clap your hands in worship, uh, those who are opposed to any kind of emotional, like waving your hands in worship, or even like referring to a preacher as doctor, like, you know, Dr. Turner, Dr. Robinson, be opposed to that. So be considered like extreme right. But then you have those who are in the middle who kind of, who try to uh, maintain relations with both sides, but they, they are not willing to go either to the far left or to the far right. And so it, that, that, that to me is, is the tension that we're facing. Um, and I guess one thing that kind of unites the groups, um, which should be scripture, should be, of course, our relationship with God, but maybe perhaps uh, some of the racial tension that, that has flared up in our country, uh, those who may be in the left, right, in the middle, or uh, and they kind of join hands to kind of uh, um, present a united front. I've kind of seen some of that as well. Uh, concerning um, our relationship with our, our, our white brothers, I think there's more work to be done. I think we can always do better. And I think uh, perhaps the current events of racial strife has kind of made some of uh, our white brothers and sisters kind of more cognizant, if you will, of, hey, we, we need to do better. We need to, uh, I, I saw where Max Lucado, you know, offered a prayer, prayer, you know, expressing repentance. And, uh, and again, I realize that even his name is somewhat controversial in our fellowship. But to me, that's a good example of a, a brother who's willing to say, hey, you know, we've, we've been right about some things, but we've also been wrong. We've been wrong. OK. And so and I think that has to come from both sides. It has to come from both sides. And so and I think um, as far as the, the intersecting, you know, that bring us together and hopefully uh, I do believe 
that the power of the Holy Spirit should prevail over all kinds of isms that we may have, whether it's feminism, uh, racism, or, or whatever, legalism, what have you. That's right. Hey, Edward, just stay right here. I'd like to bring on a few uh, guests who are going to talk a little bit about your work, and we're going to have a conversation here. So I have two panelists here that we're bringing in, Dr. Carice Berryhill, who is Special Collections Library at Abilene Christian University and teaches our course in Stone Campbell History. Hello, Dr. Berryhill. Hello. Here I am. So, so good to have you. And from across town here, B. Chris Simpson, recent HST graduate and minister at the Holmes Road Church of Christ. Hey, B. Chris. Hello, Bob. Well, uh, we thought we could have a conversation here today kind of about the book and about uh, just sort of the history of African-American churches and how uh, this relates to all of us. So I just want to think about something uh, Dr. Robinson and I kind of explored already, but there's a certain whiteness uh, to the way that we have done history in our movement. And I think one of the expressions that I reflected on in the past year that kind of showed a a little bit of a white bias was when Marshall Keeble was described as um, the most significant African-American preacher in Churches of Christ. Uh, His resume includes something like 30,000 baptisms, and he mentored Rosa Parks as lawyer, which I think would make us think, well, what other people did we have in mind who were clearly more uh, accomplished than Marshall Keeble on the other side of the race profile? So some of those things we say where we kind of set him in his place uh, might show a little bit of a white bias in the way we've done history. What do you think, Dr. Berryhill? Well, I don't think there's any doubt that uh, when white historians write the books, they, you know, their relationships are primarily with uh, scholars who are not people of color, um, and I think I think the relational web is very important. I remember first time I ever heard of S. R. Cassius. It was uh, Ed came to talk to the Christian College Librarians meeting. I think it was at Oklahoma Christian when yeah. it did, yeah, that's right. and uh, it was a it was I I did not know about Cassius, and I was glad to learn about him. And so, um, um, you know, I I appreciate um, I. I Partly because I'm a librarian and and working in archives, I really appreciate editors <laughs> because I understand their impact, and um, I think that uh, Bowser certainly stands in a very high significance as having founded Christian Echo in 1902, the longest running periodical, you know, and and it's just uh, so important. I keep hoping that somebody will find issues in their attic uh, from 19, before 1935, <laughs> um, and those can come into an archive someplace. B. Chris, you've talked about a certain whiteness to me in the way that we've displayed art in our libraries, and we walked around our library one time, and you said, wow, everyone on the walls looks the same, and then you saw a picture that didn't change your mind about that, but you did see a picture that inspired you a bit, and it was this one. Tell us about that. Yes, absolutely. I, um, I, of course, noticed all of the white pictures on the wall because I had gone to Harding University, and then after that I went to um, HST, and of course, it was a new world to me. Like, I grew up my whole life in Black Churches of Christ, and I was um, from and reared in Dallas, Texas, where there is a very large presence of Black Churches of Christ, as it is um, in close proximity to Southwestern Christian College, all were historically Black university, excuse me, all historically Black college among Churches of Christ. And so, um, you know, when I went to Harding, I had went there sight unseen. And um, when talking to, to some of my friends, and I often tell the story, when talking to some of my friends, they said, so you grew up Church of Christ? And I told them, yes. And, and they said, wow, um, what kind of Church of Christ? And I picked up on the question. I was like, I mean, it was a black Church of Christ. And they said, wow, we did not know that there were black people in the Churches of Christ. And they were telling me, you know, like, no offense. 
And I told them, really, um, no offense taken, because I did not know there were white people in the Church of Christ. I mean, that's just how thick and how um, heavy my church association was among black churches. And so then when I went to Harding, when I went to HST, to see the art, to hear the stories, to learn the information, all new, all very insightful, but it just um, showed just the type of polarity you're describing when you say um, from a white perspective or quote whiteness, because um, when I took Don Meredith, who I call the Don, when I took Don Meredith's class, um, ATR, Advanced Theological Research, which was all our favorite class at the university, um, we went into the archive and I saw that picture of Marshall Keeble, who I heard about uh, growing up, who was a staple in conversations that I had with my youth counselors and the older people of my church. My granddaddy was an elder in the Churches of Christ for 45 years. And so when I saw that picture on a man, uh, it was on a pulpit, a lectern that sits in the Meredith archive. And when I, thought it was a deep feeling in my soul that for that though I, I love Harding and I owe a lot to Harding, it seemed like to see that there, it was the first time that I felt in my soul a type of camaraderie and recognition that I had never really felt before. Now, Tanya Bryce says the same thing that you said a minute ago, that she grew up in the black churches of Christ and really was not aware at all of the white churches of Christ. You know, I grew up in Dallas. I went to a public high school. I graduated in 1968. There was not a person of color in my high school. There were 3,600 students in my high school, not one person of color. And that was a, a product of that time and that place. I've wondered about this, and, and Dr. Robinson, you may have a comment on this, but a lot of our institutional history and the way that we tell history has been through institutions. And so even if you read some of the Church of Christ histories, they're about this is what happened at this college, and this is what happened at this nonprofit, and this is what happened with this broadcasting group. Well, those institutions have had some checkered pasts relative to racism, and we don't appreciate sort of the contributions of people the way that we would if we focused instead on churches, which have had robust contributions. Um, and so preachers have, uh, African-American preachers have had significant roles in both faith communities and in their local communities. And I just wonder, as historians, how do you think kind of where we locate the, the energy of the story changes the history that we're able to see? Mm, well, let me make sure. Let me make sure I understand your question. Your question has to do with how institutions and churches kind of inter interrelate. Is that basically what you're. Yeah, if we, I mean, if we tell the story of churches of Christ based on, well, this college does this and this college does this, oh, okay. or this, um, if we talk about d different things like uh, the the journals and the papers. If we tell it that way, we don't necessarily, it seems like that's a way that might marginalize the story of African-American figures who haven't played a significant role in some of those institutions because of the, the historic limitations of the schools. Oh, yes, yes, that, that's a good point. Yeah, and I think there's, there's uh, definitely a truth to that. Um, when you consider, it's actually quite, challenging to get at the um, what I would co consider like the complete story of African-American Churches of Christ because of Southwestern Christian College um, and of course the Christian Echo as um, Clarice referred to earlier established in 1902 but we do not have a, a complete run of uh, journals from 1902 to, to the present. In fact, as of now, it's not even um, in operation. And so, and so it, it's quite challenging, but there are ways of piecing it together. But unlike um, our white historians, white churches, white institutions, 
who have over the years done a lot, uh, a better job of uh, chronicling and kind of archiving uh, those materials. Uh, to me, they're, they are in a better position, if you will, to research the story and, and, and tell it. And so, and, and that may be one of the reasons why uh, the stories of African Americans and Churches of Christ have kind of been, been neglected. I think it's much easier to tell the story of an institution because institutions keep records. And congregational records are really very difficult to locate. To, and, and congregations don't typically think about preserving their story. B. Chris, I remember when you decided to study all the bulletins from Holmes Road. Remember those? And you had to do, but, but they were determined to hold on to them and not bring them into the library as a permanent collection. Um, I would say that that's really unusual that Holmes Road had a complete run of bound bulletins for you to even work from. Uh, I know lots of white churches that really aren't that careful with their own histories, their own records. And, um, um, you know, that makes it makes Ed's job really harder to locate where these deposits of materials are. I think they have to be really in preachers' families to a large extent. And that's a matter of building relationships and then building trust with uh, people who can steward those records uh, in for another 300 years. I'm curious. We, we, we gave our, uh, our guests an opportunity to shoot some questions as they come to mind. And so we have one here that I'd like to kind of fire. Dr. Robinson, um, the, one person is asking, uh, what is the relationship kind of in race relations, however we want to say that, within the Stone Camel movement prior to 1906, which is the division of the Disciples and Churches of Christ, uh, set forth by, uh, acknowledged by David Lipscomb, 1906. What, what do we know and kind of um, what, what is the story there to how well, maybe after the Civil War and before 1906, how would we characterize those relations? Yes, uh, good question. Uh, I would say, well, we do know that in 1896, that's when Plessy versus Ferguson legalized segregation. Uh, but even before 1896, mm, we have what's called de facto segregation. What that simply means is that blacks and whites were, according to custom, de facto means according to custom. So according to custom, blacks and whites were moving in opposite directions, okay? Actually, um, after the Civil War, but it was legalized. That's when de facto became, de facto segregation became the jure, meaning according to the law in 1896. So, so before that time, most in the Stone Campbell movement, restoration movement, they adhered to that, you know, separate schools, separate churches, and separate neighborhoods, and on, on down the line, okay? Um, in fact, um, one uh, noteworthy historian uh, called it the, the God of segregation. And uh, I, I believe that that God with a little g pervaded uh, the Stone Campbell movement for the most part, that it was, you know, separate schools, separate churches. Having said that, you did have individuals such as David Lipscomb, who went against the grain. Uh, we have uh, two notable examples of that. Um, one in 1887, 1878, when a black man in McKinley, Texas, McKinney, Texas, applied for uh, membership to a predominantly white congregation. He was denied um, access, denied membership, and Lipscomb learned about it, and he railed through the pages of the Gospel Advocate. In fact, in the 1960s, Arden Hogan will pick up on that story and uphold Lipscomb as an example of one who championed racial equality, racial segregation, racial uh, justice. And then, of course, in 1907, which is out after, of course, 1906, but uh, you do have, I think, Lipscomb serves as an example of one who went against uh, the grain, uh, even though most of our churches, for the most part, practice segregation. Mm. B. Chris, uh, 
I, I just want you to kind of get some feel. You're you're in ministry. You're in a church that is uh, pretty pretty diverse racially. What what would you hope? Uh, to gain, and what do you think would be for the kingdom would be beneficial about white Christians in your church learning more of the story that we're talking about today? Yes, I think that um, a person's narrative, a person's story is their soul. And I think their relationship is soul to soul. So that if you know a story or a narrative of a person, you actually know the person more, you know the person deeper. And I think that one thing that is difficult for my white brothers and sisters to understand is how they're in, in a way because history, school, education, because the story and the narrative of whiteness is so pervasive and so systematically taught on every level, there is sort of a deeper familiarity that minorities may have with the white population than white people as the majority may have with the minority population. And so when you talk about racial healing, it becomes an impossibility without the souls of people. And to know and to mesh and to combine and get to know the souls of others, you must know one's narrative. You must know the backstory because that is where the history is. And Dr. Robinson even made mention of this, that history is biography and biography is narrative, the story of a person in a place, on a land, with people, in a building, all of it adds to the story of who we are. And so knowing these stories create the foundation of mutual respect and mutual ownership. There's so much here and there's, uh, there's so much left we can learn. I just wanna take a moment and uh, give everyone here who's watching this an opportunity. There's this book, if, uh, which is a, a really worthwhile thing to own, and you, and you can buy that book. And even in the bibliography of it, there's an incredible list of resources uh, to better familiarize yourself. I would encourage you to look at Edward's other offerings who have covered significant figures in Churches of Christ and their contribution to this larger story. This is not enough time today to dedicate to this, uh, but it is something that we all can be involved in and becoming more aware of it each day. B. Chris, Dr. Barry Hill, Dr. Robinson, we thank you all so much for joining us for this virtual lunch and learn today. We thank you all for your ministries and for the way that you represent the school so proudly in what you're doing. We do appreciate you. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Those of you who are able to be with us, we encourage you, go out, support this book, go buy the book. Ride and sing, ride and